Hi, this is Dr. Kat Fleece from Central New Mexico Community College. This is video M, the second to last video on the heart. We're focusing on cardiodynamics again, especially stroke volume in this video. Remember the formula for stroke volume. It's the difference between end diastolic volume, that is the amount of blood in the heart after full relaxation, and subtract from that the ESV, that is how much blood is left in the heart after the blood has been ejected after systole, after contraction. With the help of this formula, we can then try to take a look at what the three major factors are that um, impact stroke volume. And these factors are going to do that either through EDV, through ESV, or sometimes even both. So let's take a look at this. The first factor we're going to discuss that affects stroke volume we call preload. And it refers to the amount of blood that can literally stretch our fibers, our muscle fibers, to then initiate contraction, which results in ejection of the blood. And of course, that relates to stroke volume. So in other words, as more blood fills the heart to where our end diastolic volume begins to rise, we're going to stretch the fibers of the ventricles more. That's really what that preload is. It's the load of the blood onto the stretching of the ventricles. And the more they are stretched, the more we're going to see that the muscle cells contract, and of course, the more of a, or the higher a stroke volume um, is witnessed. Now, there is a law that you will hear often mentioned when we talk about the heart, and this is a law that was formed by two scientists, and so we call it the Frank Starling Law. And it refers to the fact that the contraction, the contracting of the muscle fibers depends on their initial length and therefore how much they can stretch. So what we find is that cardiac muscle fibers, if we compare cardiac muscle fibers to skeletal muscle fibers, we find that they're shorter. As a matter of fact, if we compare the sarcomeres of, um, you know, remember your sarcomeres, I'm not drawing this very well, but just to give you an, a quick um, visual with the thick filaments here approximately, if we compare the size of a sarcomere in skeletal muscle with that of cardiac muscle tissue, the sarcomere of heart muscle is shorter. And therefore, it can be stretched more. If a muscle cell is short, it can be stretched more. And if a muscle cell can be stretched more, it can also respond with a stronger contraction. And that is exactly what the Franklin Star Frank Starling Law is referring to. So clearly, this factor called preload that impacts stroke volume is going to impact stroke volume via EDV, as I show you here. We say that it's an intrinsic factor because it's innate to the heart muscle tissue. There's nothing coming from outside of the heart to, to create this particular factor. Now, there are various things that can impact preload. Clearly, the amount of blood that is returned to the heart and how fast the heart fills with that blood. Um, so, for instance, if we have a slow heart rate, then we're going to have much more time to fill the heart and that will eventually lead to a higher EDV and therefore higher e uh, stroke volume. If, on the other hand, we exercise and we increase our heart rate, we also, during exercise, increase our venous return. So notice that here we increase our heart rate, here we decrease our heart rate. But if we exercise, we also get our blood to be returned um, much better. And that inc increases our preload, which again in impacts our stroke volume. Of course, if we are bleeding out 
or we have a very, very rapid heart rate, we're going to see a decreased preload and therefore decreased stroke volume. The second factor that affects stroke volume is the strength with which, for, which contraction occurs. Now this time we are looking at extrinsic factors, factors that occur from outside the heart. Contractility is influenced by a variety of chemicals, including neurotransmitters as well as hormones and possibly medication. So, for instance, let's take a look at what we call positive inotropic factors. These are factors, inotropic referring to factors that affect contractility. If they are said to be positive inotropic factors, they are going to increase contractility. If they are negative, they are going to decrease contractility. Well, an obvious positive inotropic factor are the, is the neurotransmitters released by our sympathetic nervous system, norepinephrine and epinephrine. Norepinephrine is released by the sympathetic fibers, but we also have uh, norepinephrine plus epinephrine released by the adrenal medulla. These neurotransmitters slash hormones can actually increase the in influx of calcium from the extracellular fluid into our muscle cell and if we have more calcium flowing in we're going to see that muscle contraction will increase because of course more calcium ions can bind to troponin complexes. If we see more muscle contraction occurring we're going to leave less blood behind in our heart and that increases our stroke volume. Don't forget stroke volume is the difference between EDV and ESV. So if we keep this number as small as possible, this number is going to stay high. And that of course um, is also going to impact cardiac output. There are other examples of positive inotropic factors such as glucagon, which is a hormone produced by our pancreas, which works opposite to insulin. Thyroxine, one of the thyroid hormones, and digitalis, which is a, a medication. Negative inotropic factors include the acetylcholine released by the parasympathetic nervous system onto the heart, and also things such as acidosis. We'll learn more about that down the road, what that really means. We can provide medication that blocks um, the, cal the calcium channel so that less calcium enters into the muscle cells from the outside and we can also mess around with the potassium concentrations also influencing um, how much contraction can occur via the, um, the depolarization process. The third factor that may impact stroke volume is called afterload. So we had preload contractility. Now we're looking at afterload. This is once again an extrinsic factor. It is something that comes from, that impacts stroke volume, but it comes from outside of the heart. And it really is, it's, it's part of the pressure in the arteries that surround the heart. In other words, think of the following. If the pressure in, let's say, the aorta is significantly higher than it should be. Doesn't that mean that the ventricles have to squeeze so much harder to eject the blood, to open up those semilunar valves and get the blood into the aorta? Well, that pressure in the ventricles that must form or develop to exceed the pressure in the, in the aorta is what we call the afterload. And so you can already see that people with hypertension are going to be people that need to have a higher afterload. People who are healthy and have a normal aortic as well as pulmonary trunk pressure are not going to see that afterload really makes a difference in stroke volume unless we're seeing to, we're, we're, these people are experiencing some major, major vasoconstriction or vasodilation, depending on the kinds of stress their body is experiencing. So in most people, 
we're going to see that afterload is really not a major factor that impacts stroke volume. It really plays a role in hypertension primarily. So this wraps up our discussion of the three factors that affect stroke volume by manipulating either EDV or ESV. Preload is going to impact EDV primarily and can to some extent also impact ESV. Contractility primarily impacts ESV and afterload is again going to impact ESV. In our next video and our last video, we'll take a look at how heart rate can be manipulated. And once we have discussed that, we can come back to stroke volume and heart rate and look at some flow charts to understand how cardiac output can be changed in the body.